Hi, my name's Leon Rowe, currency trader and trading coach at trading180.com and welcome to this week's Forex and Gold Supply and Demand Fundamental and Technical Analysis. Um, getting into the week ahead, jumping straight into it, 23rd of July. It will be a very busy week in the US with the spotlight on the Fed's interest rate decision and the advanced uh, estimate of second quarter GDP growth. Other important releases to watch out for include the PCE price index, and that's important um, for monetary policy, durable goods orders, and S&P global PMI readings. Additionally, investors will closely follow the interest rate decisions from the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan, as well as inflation rates for Germany, France, Spain, and Australia. Finally, there will be the release of flash PMI readings for Japan, um, sorry, Australia, Japan, France, Germany, and the UK and the Euro area, along with the LFO Business Climate Report for Germany. So lots of uh, market moving news data coming out this week. And now starting on uh, some technicals and uh, looking at the dollar index and uh, <clears throat> from a fundamental perspective, in terms of interest rates, the Fed are expected to hike uh, two more. They've signaled that they're hiking two more times according to their dot plot, but the market pricing in only one more hike. And so uh, going to the Bloomberg article, Fed seen hiking final time in a 22 year peak in economist survey. So most economists expect the Federal Reserve to lift interest rates one more time next week as it ends a 16 month hiking cycle that has been the most aggressive fight against US inflation in 40 years. And so, yeah, the end of the hiking cycle is near. And, but also as well, the Fed um, has seen actually holding rates uh, higher for longer and then see a cut in March. So <clears throat> there's that as well. So uh, at the moment, uh, the dollar index uh, could be uh, potentially bouncing around this uh, 100 area and even actually start to probably go lower as I think the uh, the hike has been priced in already <clears throat> so we might see start to see a, a range or an auction between maybe these 103s if prices can get all the way up here uh, but more than likely I think prices are likely to kind of come to the downside and maybe start to hit those 99, 98, uh, 97 in the short term. I do think towards the end of the year though at the dollar actually might uh, be a buy, but in the in the short term and in, in the next maybe you know quarter, I think the dollar is uh, going to be a sell, providing the data supports that narrative. So, what I mean by that is that inflation needs to remain low um, and trend towards the uh, the Fed's two percent target, uh, and then that will in turn. Uh, uh, cause the Federal Reserve to not want to rate high, high, um, uh, hike rates and hold rates. And uh, then you want to really kind of trade any divergences in monetary policy. So if the, if the uh, dollar are uh, holding rates, but yeah, there's another central bank who are still looking to hike rates, then you want to buy the one that is hiking rates and <clears throat> uh, sell the one that is uh, holding rates, right? And that, that will be the situation for the dollar. And so I think any pullbacks on the dollar are going to be um, shorting opportunities, providing, again, the data does support that narrative. Anything that supports more rate hikes uh, for the dollar, then the dollar is a buy. So the data needs to confirm the uh, the bias. Uh, moving on to the dollar yen, and I'm actually um, medium term uh, bearish on this, as in um, my bias is to buy the Japanese yen. Now, the yen, um, the Bank of Japan sees little need to act on yield curve control for now, sources say. And really, yield curve control is, um, is a way that the central bank was um, devaluing their currency by um, controlling the yield curve. And by removing yield curve control, uh, that is expected to appreciate the currency. It's uh, one of the steps towards actually a um, uh, central bank potentially hiking rates. And so uh, at the moment, Bank of Japan officials see little 
urgent need to address the side effects of its yield curve control program at this point, though they expect to discuss the issue according to people familiar with the matter. Central Bank looks at the cost of benefits of yield curve control at every meeting and will reach a final decision at its policy meeting next week after scrutinizing economic data and financial markets up to the last minute according to the people. Now, um, one of the things that you need to look towards to determine how soon um, the Bank of Japan are uh, looking to adjust your curve control is inflation. And their inflation came out recently um, a bit stickier than um, than they expected, a little higher. Um, so that should put pressure on the Bank of Japan eventually, whether it's going to be you know this week in July or at their next meeting, um, whenever that is. Uh, in the future, the expectation is for the Bank of Japan to eventually um, adjust yield curve control. So, as prices, if prices do start to come up to this one four five area, one four six, and even before that, but just from a technical analysis perspective, these highs or even above, I think these are going to be really nice um, areas for me anyway to look for uh, shorting opportunities. Because you have again one central bank that is looking to actually appreciate their currency to get inflation down uh, via monetary policies, and you have another central bank, the the the, the yeah, um, sorry the dollar, the Fed, who are looking to actually hold rates as inflation has come down to their two percent target. So there's a divergence in the trade idea. So that's what I'm looking towards in the coming well from now until the coming months, looking at the dollar swiss and there were um some analysis from last week nothing's really happened last week there has been a bit of a move to the upside um in terms of any kind of levels to kind of look towards any buying there really wasn't anything this is back in 2015 so i wouldn't necessarily use that as any kind of indication that you know prices should bounce from here so these were really the options that you had. Either you had prices pulling all the way back up to this supply zone or you had a move that caused prices to make a bit of maybe a higher high at the moment, which is happening, and then a move to the downside. Then you need to pull back to that supply zone and then that's the trade there. Or currently we've actually got a bearish candle close on the daily. So what you would then be looking for is maybe some sort of move to the downside move back up into that supply zone and then a move to the downside there. So um, this isn't really a, a, a pair that I'm looking to trade, but these are the options that you have for the dollar Swiss. For me, no, no real buying unless we start to again, get some sort of higher high here, and then maybe even a pullback into this area here, which would actually now be considered a bit of demand. You can put that on there. Not the strongest, actually, in fact, it's, it's okay as it goes. It's taken out that level of supply as it goes, because you've got lower highs, lower lows there. So, yeah, in fact, um, you could look at that as an area of demand and a bit of a pullback if you do want to buy the dollar against the Swiss franc. So, yeah, in fact, that is a, a decent um, area to look for any kind of buy trades. The uh, dollar CAD, um, dollar CAD, again, not a pair that I'm looking to trade right now, but this level is obviously held um, if the Bank of Canada continue to hike um, after the Federal Reserve has have held rates then you should want to see at least um, some sort of pullback and then a move to the upside or to, sorry I should say to the downside uh, before looking at um, yeah before taking the, uh, the Bank of Canada trade if you're looking at the Federal Reserve continuing to hike rates beyond their next hike, then that actually would be a really nice buy. Um, if, again, the Bank of Canada is seen as not hiking rates now, the kind of 50-50, the, uh, the Bank of Canada uh, rate hike expectations have reduced a bit. Doesn't mean it's totally off the table, but at the moment it has reduced. So the Canadian, I think there are opportunities to short the Canadian dollar if um, they have actually decided to hold their interest rate hiking cycle the New Zealand dollar. So last week, there was a really nice level that stop hunted. 
um, but uh, with the RBNZ rate hold expected this was you know pretty much likely to happen the dollar yes was seen as you know the the weaker of the, um, the two last week but overall when it came to who was going to be hiking the fed was still expected to hike right and so this was a really nice uh, trade setup technically if anyone does want to buy the new zealand dollar then you're looking at any areas now or down into these uh, this demand zone here personally i don't think i would really want to be a buyer of the new zealand dollar although there are rumors that the new zealand dollar and the rbnz could start to actually look to high rates if inflation is persistent but they haven't um signaled that just yet so let's see the data will have to support that so if you do see a pull back up into that area there i think that's a decent zone to look for any kind of short trades or you could look towards this level of resistance, past resistance here, and uh, any pullbacks into this level here before looking at um, a short trade. Um, overall, I think the dollar should be the, uh, the stronger out of the two. Uh, pound, dollar, and again, some scenarios that were playing out from, uh, from last week, technically, and we saw this move to the downside and this was really driven by uh, UK inflation. So softer than uh, forecast UK inflation um, is latest boost for bonds. So reports add uh, to repricing sparked by US data last week. So the rally sweeping across global bond markets received a boost on Wednesday amid uh, mounting signs pressure uh, price pressures which is inflation are easing in some of the world's biggest economies so in the uk bond led the advance with two year uh, yield set for its biggest slide since march after data showed the nation's inflation cooled more than expected so with that um basically the expectation was for a larger hike because inflation you know in the uk um is the is one of the highest if not the highest in like the g10 and so when inflation you know came down more than expected basically the market started to reprice um the value of the pound against the us dollar but that it didn't take rate hikes off the table and so i do think the pound is still a buy at least in the short term they had some positive um economic news as well and so i do think now prices coming down to this area the 127s if it can get here i think is going to be a really nice buy uh, for the pound against the dollar as again the market is pricing only one more hikes or one more hike i don't know why i've got fed equals fed twice um yeah so so one more uh, hike whereas the bank of england the market is still pricing in two to three hikes so um, i think any pullbacks into this 127 area 12714 i think are going to be it's going to be a really nice buy for the um for the pound against the dollar trading those interest rate differentials and also as well we do have a supply zone right here so if you did want to get involved in trying to short the pound in the future then you have really that area there to look towards but um my bias would be towards going long on the uh, pound dollar euro dollar again we had a pullback into uh, this support or oh, resistance turn support uh, but no demand zone yet and so in fact i know i deleted it but really that's the play i think you'd have to see demand really kind of um uh, uh prove proof of demand before looking at uh, a pullback into the zone and looking at that as a as a buy trade right here so some traders do trade lots of traders in fact do trade support and resistance areas and there's going to be a lot of traders looking at buying at this area it's very obvious le level um but personally i'd want to see proof of um of value proof of demand before prices before i look to buy right the institutions have to kind of tell me that they're that this is a bargain price right and so but the nearest area of supply at the moment has to be all the way down 
these demand zones unless obviously new demand zones are created now looking at the euro uh, ecb's higher for longer rate plan fails to convince economists and so most analysts in surveys see two more hikes uh, to four percent deposit rate but first cut seen in march with high uncertainty over path ahead and so the european central bank plans to maintain interest rates at their eventual peak for an extended period isn't convincing economists who see it starting to unravel in just six months and so um although in the short term we have you know expected two hikes remember when we went back to the uh the fed and we were talking about you know economists expect rates to stay higher for longer yeah and see the first cut in march um the European Central Bank, yeah, um, is expecting, in fact, um, the um, cuts to come a lot sooner after they've hiked, right? So, at the same time, it looks like um, the the um, yeah the European Central Bank are looking to probably embark on rate cuts in March as well. So. Both central banks looking to potentially, or economists are thinking that both central banks are looking to uh, cut in March. So let's see what happens there. But um, in the short term, I do think the euro versus the dollar um, should want to move higher. Um, but the pullback could be deeper before it goes higher, right? So it could start to bounce off of its, uh, you know, if you get a buy at the 108, that'd be brilliant, right? But likely you're likely to see some bounces probably off of these, you know, maybe 111, 110 areas. But for me, that would have to create the demand before, again, me looking for any kind of move to the uh, upside. So those are really the uh, the options that, uh, you know, you, you have if you're looking to trade, um, you know, daily supply uh, and demand zones. And talking about supply, there is a supply zone here now. And so that's really where, you know, the options are. My bias is still to the upside based off of interest rate divergences. And if, again, the data supports uh, that narrative. Euro yen, and um, I think the euro yen has come up to a really nice technical area. Um, especially if we have yield curve control um, announced on Friday. I think this is going to be a brilliant area to look for a um, a uh, short and so um, but it depends again on what the market thinks and what happens with the Bank of Japan we do have some demand a demand zone there as well we really created demand zone as we have higher highs higher lows being made so we've got a high a low a high right there and so any pullbacks into the demand zone is going to be nice supported by the fact that in the short term the bank of japan is holding rates and yield curve control um, is not is not adjusted right and so if prices pull back and that scenario happens i think that's going to be a really nice buy for the euro but if the opposite happens in terms of the bank of japan actually adjust yield curve control then i think that is going to be a really nice short and in fact i don't think these these demand zones are really going to hold it's going to be a lot of um, supply coming into the market, a lot of buying for the yen. Looking at the pound, euro pound, and euro pound broke through that area, and that was really kind of based off of um, the um, the expectation, the inflation uh, data coming down, and the expectation that the Bank of England uh, were going to uh, reduce their hiking. Or the amount of hikes that they were going to do in terms of uh, 50 basis points now reduced to a um, 25 basis point hike and so right now we've bouncing off of this supply zone um, this pair is a tricky pair because both central banks are hiking the it looks like the bank of england have probably just seen slightly slightly more hawkish but there was again a repricing of the bank of england rate hikes and so i think we should want to see some sort of area like this you know 
uh, contain the uh, the valuation of the euro and the pound. So if you do want to get short, I think that's going to be a nice area to look for short trades. If you're looking for a long trade, it looks like at the moment you'd have to wait for prices to really kind of pull all the way back down to the lows unless some new um, demand is created somewhere within this area. Aussie dollar and the Australian dollar again came up to this really nice technical area if you want to be a buyer of the uh, US dollar last week that was a really nice area to look for buy trades um, but with the Australian dollar actually looking to potentially look to hike rates twice uh, inflation is going to be important this this week uh, for, for, the, for the Australian dollar and so if inflation is, is sticky or higher than expected then I think this area here is going to be really, really nice for a buy trade uh, for the RBA against the um, the Fed. So you've got actually, in fact, quite a wide supply zone. I'm going to draw it from. Actually, I'll keep that one there, and I'll draw uh, this one from really. It's like this high to here. Uh, supply and then you've also got uh, supply and then you've also got an area of looks like some support and resistance in that area as well just one of the uh, confluences you can use so if you do want to look for any kind of long trades I think right now is as it comes into that demand zone in anticipation of higher inflation or at least sticky inflation for the RBA I think that's going to be a nice area to look for some long trades but if you did want to look for any kind of short trades in case um, the RBA don't hike rates and the Fed continue to hike rates then I think that's going to be a decent area to look for some short uh, trades right there and finally gold and so gold we've got um, yeah prices have really come up to this uh, top the top end of this supply zone um, coinciding with some uh, dollar strength of course golden dollar work inversely so this was you know the plan or one of the plans anyway or one of the uh, scenarios that could happen and so we've had a move to the upside and it has capped which has coincided with um, the dollar index in fact you know making a bit of a rally right there and so that level as well has started to drop but if you believe that the, the dollar is going to get weaker then you're looking for really kind of pullbacks on gold either into that demand zone or into this um, this demand zone here I think this is going to be a really nice area to look for the 1900s decent area to look for some um, some buys on gold if you're looking for at least some short term or medium term uh, dollar um, uh, dollar sells and so yeah that's where we are and before I forget um, at the end of this video which is pretty much now the next section is going to be about trading psychology I'm going to share a video that I held with uh, the group on um, our webinars on Wednesday, private webinars and trading psychology and the five wires and the root issues um, when I was uh, really kind of struggling with my trading psychology and these are really the main um, root issues that I had to deal with when dealing with trading psychology, right? And uh, the five whys, I'll explain that in the actual next video, so in the next part. So uh, stick around for that. Um, and again, uh, end of this video, Thank you for uh, watching this far and don't forget to like, subscribe and share with your fellow trading colleagues if you find the videos I provide useful every week and I uh, hope you all have a brilliant trading week. Take care and speak to you all until the next video. Got what's to do with trading psychology. Where am I now? All right, questions for group call. And it's quite a, a comprehensive question, I guess. And I wanted to kind of simplify it because I think as Jeff pretty much pointed out, it's like um, you could write a 300 page essay on it, but they are great questions. So I'll read it out and then I'll give my take on it. So uh, Sonny said basically uh, that he would appreciate if 
um, I could delve into some of the crucial aspects of trading psychology. And maybe we need a separate webinar for this if other members of the group are interested. I'm particularly interested in learning about the following topics, uh, trading psychology, exploring, um, exploring the psychological aspects of trading, such as fear, greed, and impatience, understanding how our emotions can cloud judgment and hinder objective decision-making tips and techniques to maintain uh, and a disciplined and focused mindset sorry in any market situation managing emotions in uh, in drawdown strategies to cope with drawdowns as they are are an inevitable part of trading absolutely uh, how to stay composed and avoid compulsive actions during uh, these downturns ensuring we don't fall into a downward spiral of emotional decision making absolutely uh, and the power of fundamentals building a strong belief in the significance of fundamental analysis in the midst of a highly volatile and speculative market, how fundamentals can serve as an anchor during turbulent times, helping us to stay grounded and make informed uh, trading decisions. So there's a lot there. Um, but what I wanted to do is to kind of maybe just narrow it down to, I guess, um, the my my basic approach to trading uh, psychology and um, I don't know if many of you know about the five whys there was um, there was a five whys does anyone know about the five whys asking yourself five whys or asking to solve a problem uh, five whys anyways basically um, it's a technique. So five whys is an is a iterative interrogative technique uh, used to explore the cause and effect relationship um, relationships underlying a particular problem. So in trading, you know our particular problems we have to be aware of are why we do certain things. Why do we take profit too early? Why do we you know not follow the rules that we set out? Why do we you know go against um, certain things that we know we should be doing? Um, and then we keep making those same mistakes, right? So those are the issues that we um, that we go through as trading and, 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 and our trading psychology, yeah? So this is the primary goal of a technique is to, uh, is to determine the root cause, yeah? Or defect or problem by repeating the question why five times. The answer to the fifth why should reveal the root cause of the problem. So the technique was described by uh, Tai Chi, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, Ono, uh, a Toyota at Toyota Motor Corporation. But there are criticisms of this, of course, as is others at Toyota elsewhere have criticized the fiber wise technique for various reasons. But it's a great, for me, using this, I use this um, over the years, um, especially, you know, when I was trading with Mark and um, just asking myself, why constantly so not just settling with you know the first answer I came to and um, what I discovered in fact just my own personal um, whys were these these were my main root issues when I asked myself you know why and it doesn't necessarily mean you know I asked myself five why sometimes I got to this answer or these answers um, you know maybe after asking myself why three times or two times or four times you don't necessarily have to ask yourself why five times but this is what i these are the ones that i kind of settled on over the years and uh remembered as well and so my root issues um that i remember were first of all unrealistic trading expectations yeah so the reason why for example i would um I would not, I would, you know, tend to jump from strategy to strategy, yeah, was because, or not follow the strategy and maybe add to certain things and, you know, try to tweak a strategy and maybe take away things and add an indicator and not add this indicator and add this entry and not, um, was because um, of unrealistic expectations, yeah. Um, yeah, I will, I will do, by the way, I will do, John. Unrealistic expectations from um, trading expectations. So, you know, what does that mean? So it comes from, obviously, we all get into this to make money, right? But the realities of, of trading um, in the way that I do, for example, or the way that I've discovered, and I say I, I didn't necessarily discover it, but I guess the way that I settled on 
Um, it was, actually, I'll, I'll rephrase that. So the realities of, of trading, um, you know, we kind of get into it in terms of like, you know, taking 10 trades a day or 100 trades a day. And the more that you, the more trades that you take, you know, should be the more money you make. You know, that's an unrealistic expectation. You can say, I can take a thousand trades over the year and break even, or I can take maybe 10 trades over the year and make money, right? So, you know, the amount of trades you take doesn't equate the, the, the amount of profit that you'll make. And so, you know, just from unrealistic, having unrealistic expectations, um, you know, and what was sold online on YouTube and, you know, you can, uh, you know, make money in, you know, and consistently in, you know, a month's time and, you know, making quick money fast, a lot of money fast, that psychologically um, were, 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 was, was some of the reasons why I was, you know, repeating a lot of bad habits and not necessarily um, accepting of, you know, certain things that, you know, Mark and other people were, were saying that I, even though I knew to be true, I was just thinking to myself, well, you know, that was going against what my belief was at the time, which was, you know, I was believing that unrealistic expectations in trading was actually realistic. And so that was detrimental to, um, you know, my trading psychology as to why I was doing, making certain mistakes consistently. Um, another one was my belief in um, my trading approaches. So over the years, you know, before I, you know, kind of was trading with, uh, with you know, included fundamentals in my trading um, and trading technical analysis, um, the belief as to the reasons, you know, belief in the actual system that I was trading or the strategy I was trading or the, you know, uh, the approach is a massive one as well, right? And you only really kind of get belief by backtesting and even backtesting, you know, there's a difference between knowing something and believing something, yeah? So we can know the results of our backtests, but but doesn't mean that we believe it, yeah? And what I mean by that is, is this, is we believe that, or there's a difference between believing that you should go to the gym and knowing that you should go to the gym, yeah? So everyone here knows that if you go to the gym, yeah, it keeps you healthy, etc. but we don't do it every day, right? We just, you know, we'd rather sit on the sofa, watch TV, Netflix, whatever it is, surf the net and do whatever it is, right? Now, imagine believing that you must go to the gym or let's say, for example, something really bad's going to happen or you'll die. You will end up going to the gym, you see what I'm saying, like religiously. You don't, you know, you, you wouldn't even hesitate, right? And so there's a massive difference between knowing something and believing something. And so you have to have and develop a belief. I believe, there's no one that can tell me that fundamentals, fundamental analysis, a fundamental approach doesn't work right now, you know what I mean, or, or, or ever. So I've developed that belief, whereas, you know, people who are new to trading fundamentals or just trading in general um, have to develop that belief over time. So that was one of the reasons why, um, you know, I was making the mistakes that I was doing in, in trading and my trading psychology was affected. Hyper-focusing on outcome over the process. So that's again, instant versus delayed um, account balance gratification, right? So we've all been there where we hyper-focus on just that one trade or those two trades um, not realizing that there are only really one or two trades in the um, sequence that you're going to take for the rest of your life, right? You're going to take hundreds and thousands of trades, uh, obviously, if you stay within the trading, um, you know, if you continue to trade, but really focusing on that one trade and not looking at the bigger picture, which is, and it kind of um, goes into the next point, which is basically accepting of probabilities and the law of large numbers, and understanding probabilities and the law of large numbers. So the law of large numbers just being um, the way that numbers are distributed and randomly and over, over a long period of time. So we know that we can, um, if you flip a coin, for example, it's 50-50, right? Heads or tails. You have 50% chance of getting heads or tails. But if I flip a coin 10 times, 
it, I might get maybe two heads and eight tails. If I flip it, you know, 20 times, I might get five heads and 15 tails. But over a longer period of time, a hundred flips, a thousand flips, I will get closer to that 50% um, probability heads or tails, right? But in the very, very short term, even though we know it should be 50-50, yeah, in terms of, you know, what result we get, when we don't typically get that on a coin flip, and it's the same thing with trading, right? If we're, we don't hyper-focus so much on the coin flip um, over over time, in terms of why, you know, this is going to be heads, tails, we just know that the heads or tails are going to work out in terms of 50-50, right? But in trading, we hyper-focus so much over, you know, our first maybe five, ten results, you know, ten trades, that then we start to change, right? We start to change and say, this isn't working. But, you know, when we had you know, eight heads and two tails, does that mean that the, uh, the, the, the the coin wasn't working? I'm going to get another coin because, you know, the flip's not working. Like, there's, there's something wrong with this, you know, this coin flip or this coin doing it wrong. Like, you don't, you wouldn't do that. So, the same thing, but that but we do that in trading. So, um, you know, hyper-focusing on the pro, on the outcome, yeah, and not the process and not understanding that you can have a really, you know, the perfect setup it could be an A1 setup, everything aligned, and you can still lose. You can have the worst setup in the world and actually win a trade. So, but over the long term, your decisions should be based on making more of the correct decisions over making terrible decisions. And it should lead to obviously a positive, um, you know, uh, account, account balance. Um, and then, you know, I think, yeah, the realities of drawdowns, right? So is really accepting the fact that we go through drawdowns. Everyone's going to go through drawdowns. And drawdowns might not necessarily just last for a day or a week. A drawdown can last for a month. You might not make a new um, equity high on your account for months. It can happen. And it does happen. And it will happen, right? Not everything is going to be, you know, I made, um, you know, money this month. It's it's impossible. And it goes back to unrealistic trading expectations. Regardless of what you see on TikTok or YouTube or social media, it's just that's not the realities of trading. Otherwise, um, you know, we'd all be trillionaires, right? It's 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 it's, it's um, really kind of unrealistic. And, and I get it. When we're in drawdowns, it can be really and it is I say it can be but it is frustrating right it's frustrating you think you automatically start feeling that you're doing something wrong you automatically start tweaking certain things and the strategy and you think to yourself okay well that's not working now and it's just a natural incline to try to change things um one of the things I would say is whenever I'm in a um whenever I'm in a drawdown and I, I was in one and I'm in what well, I say it was in one but Currently, I'm making my way out of my drawdown. Um, what I do is I risk less. So I, rather than, um, you know, increasing my position size, I just reduce my position sizes. Yeah. And that's something that, so I minimize the loss when I see, when I feel it coming and I see it coming in the next trades are, you know, losers, losers, win, lose, lose, win, lose, lose, lose. And I'm like, okay, do you know what? Let me just reduce my losses. Yeah, until I start getting into that win streak, and then you start feeling okay. The, the, the fundamentals are working now, right? Everything, as I say, working now. They're always working, but um, let's say, for example, forecasts, which have been a, a, a an issue over the past three, four months, right? Forecasts have been um, <laughs> forecasts have been a bit, you know, I say a bit, but they've been wrong more than they've been right in terms of major ones like you know from inflation, etc. And so. You know, when the market does start to come back in terms of, you know, forecasts start to be a bit more accurate, which I can, I'm noticing a little bit, you know, they are, they're not, you know, but at the same time, I'm seeing the fundamentals play out a bit more and forecasts play out a bit more and a bit better. That's when you can start to now increase your position size gradually. Do you know what I mean? So from that perspective in terms of, you know, 
practical things you can do when you're in a drawdown is just understand that it's going to come like night follows day. It's it's going to happen. So what's the point in in trying to stress about it? Yeah, and I say, I say trying to stress, but in stressing about it, the practical thing to do is just recognize that when you're in one, reduce your position sizes, reduce your risk, minimize your risk. And then when you start to, you know, get yourself into the groove again and the market starts going your way again, then you can start to increase some of your position sizes and then, um, you know, make the uh, make those um, new equity highs again. Right. But these are were for me my root issues and the things that I had to address over the years. And by the way, as well, you never 100 percent like master this. There's always something here that pops its head up. Do you know what I mean? Um, or you kind of have to think about it to not think about it, right? So what I mean by that is if I say to you, you know, don't think about an elephant. You're going to have to think about an elephant first before you say to yourself, don't think about it, yeah? So you have to always think about these things, yeah, whenever you're going through it. And then you say to yourself, okay, <laughs> yeah, you just did it, right? So, um, and these things never, these things never ever go away. You're constantly having to remind yourself. I'm com constantly having to remind myself if I'm looking to take profits at a certain, you know, um, uh, area, right? Let's say I'm up. Excellent. I made, I made a decent amount of money on that on on the pound New Zealand, right? So I'm thinking. I think I took profit just before my target, which was, um, I think it was like 80% of the area. Where was it? One, one second, I'll show you. So, uh, I'll give you an example, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't this one. It wasn't that recent one moved there. It was this one right here. 